Welcome to Chicago. We have an incredible skyline. When you consider the architectural advances that we've seen in this country, you'll want to move here too. When you look at the bustling downtown urban center, the number one place for relocation for, for millennials in the entire country. When you think about all that happens when you have people who are willing to commit to improving the business infrastructure, such that we've, we've actually recruited 42 corporate headquarters since 2011 alone to come to Chicago and make this its, uh, their home. When we think about what community means in Chicago, we're often put in a position where we have to say, my goodness, I love my neighbor. I want to treat my neighbor better, and I want to move to a city that respects and understands the power of neighborliness that understands that good schools and a quality education, that the ability to, to, to connect with someone over a shared meal at a local restaurant is exactly why you should come to Chicago, because it is the city of opportunity, one of the fastest growing segregated cities in the entire country. <laughs> when we consider what neighborhoods are, what children should have, how they should play and where they should be playing, who their friends should be, who their classmates are, and what they're going to learn from these incredible diverse experiences that they're going to get in the fastest growing segregated city in the country. I say you should move to Chicago. I say you should consider what it means to be in a place where proximity means you never have to see the people across town. You see, my family came to this city through a typical story for black people here in Chicago. Uh, my great-grandfather, Cleonius, when he found out that he was to have my grandmother, Eudora Ramey, he decided uh, no heir of mine shall be born in the state of Louisiana. You see, he was, he was trying to survive uh, coming up from his, his parents being slaves and sharecroppers, and he was trying to understand how he could make a better life for his family in this country, as many people do. So he said, I have to leave. And he left the South. And he did what many African Americans did at that time. He became part of what's now known as the Great Migration. In 1923, he came to Chicago, moved to the west side of Chicago, and he had this beautiful woman. She was born, Eudora Ramey. And I love this woman to death because she, she gave me so much. She taught me so much about life, about proximity, about being close to people, about being love. She taught me what it meant to endure and to be courageous. She taught me what twice as much for half as much means. She taught me what it meant to be resilient. And I'm so thankful for that, because the decisions that she made led to her buying a home in a community called North Lawndale. And if you're not familiar with North Lawndale, it's a community on the west side of Chicago. It originally was a bohemian community when it was first annexed by the city of Chicago back before the, uh, the turn of the, the, the 20th century. Uh, it eventually became one of the largest Jewish neighborhoods in the entire country. And to this day, you can still see the churches, the synagogues were at that time, with the stars of David hanging up. They're now like Baptist churches. Um, because now it's a predominantly black neighborhood. But it didn't just happen in any sort of way. You see, Eudora Ramey played a role in that. Uh, she decided to buy a house. So this is a typical decision that Americans make. You want to buy a house. And in fact, when we look at what wealth accumulation means in the city of Chicago, or even in the country, we know that a house is the number one basis of wealth accumulation in the country. And so this is a pivotal decision decision that she has to make. Where do I live? Well, she lived where she could, because at the time, she couldn't live everywhere in Chicago, because of course we had redlining. Right? We didn't get segregated overnight, and we certainly didn't get there without strong policy to create it. And so what she did was she looked at her available options, and then she made a decision to move to 746 South Kilbourne, and that's where my wonderful, wonderful father was born. Now, Paul Ramey was an incredible guy. He's a veteran from the Vietnam War. He, he grew up here in the city of Chicago. He went to Von Steuben High School. He came back here, and he had this, I think, incredible, incredible son. Incredible son. <laughs> um, and um, one of the decisions that he made is a, is a very important decision as well. You see, he decided where I was going to go to school. Now, this is a typical decision that many parents have to make. But the question is, under what circumstances are you making your decisions? Right? And so his decision that he was confronted with, because I happened to be a bit of a smart kid growing up, and he was confronted with, well, my son got into nearly every gifted center in the city. <laughs> and that's a great thing. That's what we want. We want kids who are smart to get into these better schools. But the reality is, is he decided not to let me go. 
Now, the school I was going to, as my mother would always say, not only didn't teach algebra, but refused to teach algebra. <laughs> and my father was the head of the local school council. <laughs> now, what do you do with that? Why would you not allow your child to have a better opportunity if opportunity is presented and he is literally living in a house where he is boiling his bath water because he's growing up without heat? Where he is cooking bread, toasting it in the oven, and scraping off the mold? Where he is growing up knowing when dad is happy because he's smiling and the grocery carts are full and now we have food? Why would you not allow your child to go to a better school? Because he understood that he had a decision to make. That his child wasn't born in this time, it was born in time. You see, this is how the brain drain happens. He decided to opt out. He decided to keep me out of these gifted centers. And that had a profound impact on my life. The impact it actually had was my student loans are higher because I flunked business calc one four times. <laughs> Now, I eventually went on and got a degree in economics from DePaul University, so, you know, I made it. <laughs> but the reality is it had true cost. There was another man who moved into North Lawndale. His name was Michael Trout. Now, Michael Trout was a 20-something-year-old who graduated from Wheaton College, and he and his wife got married in terrible clothing. It was the 90s. <laughs> it was the 90s. You forgive people for that. <laughs> But Michael Trout, with a full head of hair, <laughs> decided, I'm going to move in. I'm going to be a white man moving into a black neighborhood. Not only a black neighborhood, I'm going to move into a neighborhood that has been called one of the top 20 most dangerous communities in the entire United States. Not only that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into that neighborhood, and then I'm going to start living there, and I'm going to bring other people into it. I'm going to be in proximate relationship with African-American people in a drug-riddled, gang-riddled neighborhood. For him, that was a risk. For me, that was just life. So it's no risk to him. The reality of our decisions is that we're constantly evaluating our lives in the terms of what's presented to us, not just because we worked for it, but because history mandated that we be presented with that opportunity, and we alone. That's how segregation works. Chicago is not just the fastest growing city because people are choosing to buy a house and go somewhere and, 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 and build a nest egg. It's because they insist on not moving into a neighborhood and starting organizations like the Young Men's Educational Network, where I became a student because his wife became my fifth grade teacher, and then I met him when he had a ponytail. And, and, and eventually, I grew up to become a board member in this organization and then the, the director of development. And Mike and I, we raised a couple million dollars. We opened up some facilities for residential housing. We created this big sports court. And then I left, went to Africa, became a consultant, came on back, got a great job as a program officer, managed a couple million dollars in philanthropic grants, and then got my butt kicked over to the University of Chicago, and I got to teach social justice. And in that, I got in confronted with the children of the elite. And my, my fear was, how is it that they don't understand the relationships that they have with me? Why am I waking them up to what Chicago is? Why don't they know the stories that I know? Why don't they know about Lawndale? And I realized then that parents never told them. They never told them that when my grandmother bought a house in Lawndale, she bought it for $25,000, which was twice what it cost. Because the average home in Lawndale in 1947 was selling for about $12,000. But this is 17 years before the Civil Rights Act, so she had no right to not have to pay that. And the people who sold the house to her decided, hey, the law doesn't protect you, and I won't either. So this is now a market opportunity. And we have to understand that when you come from an imported people, not an immigrant people, an imported people, you always understand life on the terms of the commodity that you are. And that's a very interesting way to experience America. And so for Chicago, I think about all the opportunities that we have. I think about the opportunities to form relationships down the line through mentoring and great programs and, and, and investing in the next generation. I think about what it means to grow old with somebody, to know somebody over time as, as your gray hair grows higher and their height does. <laughs> right? I think about what it means when we say, I want to see the skyline too. And I don't want the skyline to look like the same skyline. I don't want the people that come to my neighborhood to come with badges. I don't want them to come with guns. I want them to come with opportunities and a desire for, for real relationship. I don't want my workplace to look like this. <laughs> the challenge of this is that the room that you're seeing right now is full of millennials. Think about it. So when I look at the future, I say, now how many of them are going to go to bat for me? How many of them are going to go to bat for my children to insist that the room be different, 
that when we demand a seat at the table that you make space. That if we truly believe that the pie has to grow higher, that that means that some people have to go a little lower. And that doesn't mean in terms of their opportunities, it means that they submit their privilege. And that privilege has to be extended and understood as it relates through time, not just in their time. You see, privilege is just having two good choices. In a world where you have to fight for justice, we have to indict the fact that we don't have to fight for injustice. It means that when you do nothing, you're doing everything to be a problem. <laughs> It means that, that action is the greatest thing you can do, and the least thing you can do is to say someone's life matters, especially when it hasn't for centuries. You see, this is the best time in American history to be an African American, and I am still afraid of the police. With my mouth, my knowledge, my intellect, 100 years ago, I'd be hanging from a tree. But now I'm the CEO of my own company, and that's not to say that that's any thing that America should be proud of because the blessings that I have today, I have to always question. I, I challenge you all to, to question this as well, is, is what you have and what we have because of you or in spite of you. We have to work together. That means we have to live together, build more proximate relationships with each other, choose to live, take on risk. Don't just share meals, share risk. Say we matter when you're at work. Say we matter when you're at, at home. Say we matter in the churches and the synagogues of the country, and then we will form a more perfect union. But for now, we, to me, we're just a melting pot simmering with anger. And we have to bring these divides together. There are some incredible ways to do that. I challenge everyone to consider how they can do that, to understand the privilege of two good choices, of what it means to double down and say, the fact that I feel uncomfortable is more important than the fact that you feel unsafe. Thank you.